you do. Uh, we've been here a number of years. Um, probably my my biggest claim to fame that might resonate with you is that uh, uh, I am uh, the grandfather of uh, the triplets. Uh, Brittany is my daughter, my daughter, and uh, uh, so uh, her and her family. Um, was misled somehow and moved to uh, to Virginia, but uh, uh, we'll be continuing to pray for them as they uh, are up there in all that snow and cold and ice and so forth. But uh, so that that that's who I am. Um, just a, a brief background, so you kind of know uh, my frame of reference. Uh, uh, I did uh, uh, local church uh, ministry for many, many years, and uh, uh, was a pastor and, and so forth. Uh, come from a, uh, a Baptist background. Uh, we uh, laugh about that oftentimes uh, among friends of mine and those of uh, uh, us who were in CPE, which is part of the training for chaplaincy. Um, I affectionately uh, refer to the fact that I'm a recovering Baptist, um, but... Uh, uh, you, you may fall into that category, or that may be offensive to you, I, you know, one way or the other, but um, just w- want to let you know that uh, uh, God indeed is good, and um, we all come from a, a, a different background, a different set of circumstances, uh, uh, whatever those may happen to be, God's brought us together here at this place at this time, and uh, the message... Uh, uh, I've been asked to to s- preach is is from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John, and it's a very familiar story. Actually, there are two stories there, but I'm going to uh, really just focus mainly on uh, the first story, which is the story about the uh, Samaritan woman at the well. And uh, many of you may uh, recognize kind of that title, the woman at the well. Uh, there have been a number of songs that have been written about uh, uh, that uh, kind of theme. And uh, I hope, if, if nothing else today, you go away with um, a glimpse, a picture, as it were, of, uh, of who Jesus is. And that, as such, you can encounter him uh, just as he is, and you can come to him just as you are. Uh, I know growing up uh, uh, in church, my dad was a, a minister of, of music and education, and uh, I remember uh, nearly every, uh, every Sunday morning uh, service, uh, we concluded with an invitation, uh, and uh, typically the hymn that we sang was Just As I Am, um, uh, Billy Graham, I think, uh, made that uh, uh, rather famous in his uh, crusades over the years. Uh, uh, and uh, so, really, that is how we are supposed to come. And yet, far too often, um, in the organized church, uh, we say, come as you are, but oftentimes we don't really mean that. Um, and it is a, it's a conviction of mine uh, that for so many, many years um, I was stuck in, in that uh, uh, framework. I was stuck in that um, uh, sort of religious mindset that uh, uh, said that you had to be a certain way or do certain things uh, in order to be uh, accepted uh, uh, to God and accept, acceptable to Him and to be used by Him. And um, much of what I pointed to and much of what I held on to uh, was absolutely false. Um, and so uh, I'm just here as a fellow uh, struggler uh, this morning as we uh, lead and, and look at these verses of Scripture and I hope that uh, somehow God will use me to uh, at least uh, arrest you at some point, bring you uh, to a screeching halt in your uh, uh, busy uh, life and all the things that are going on around you, 
and somehow be confronted with who Jesus is and what he wants to do in your life. And so uh, to that end, I'm, I'm going to pray real quickly, and uh, uh, we uh, ask that the, the Father bless our time together. Our Heavenly Father, we, we do come to you, and Lord, we, uh, we are needy. Uh, Lord, in and of ourselves, uh, uh, we don't have the capacity to do uh, what we are looking to do this morning, and that is to, uh, to break the bread of life, to to share the truth, uh, the power of your word, and Lord, uh, to, to go beyond just the, the meaning of the words and, and uh, the details of the story, but Lord, to uh, get to the heart of what you were trying to say in that day and age to your followers, and Lord, what you want to say to us in this day and age as your followers. And so, Lord, we just, uh, we come to you with uh, open hands and open hearts, and Lord, just pray that you would speak to us uh, from your word. Uh, Lord, let us have a glimpse of Jesus today, for it's in your name that we pray, amen. Normally, uh, I would have a a very uh, eloquent uh, outline, Uh, I I was so proud of myself over the years, uh, having alliteration and and having uh, rhyming uh, points and uh, things that I thought were real clever. Uh, But uh, we see even in the ministry of Jesus and and in what he does in this story that oftentimes he's just trying to make one simple point. And if we can pick up on that, if we can learn and understand that one simple point, we don't need to have uh, three points in a poem or, or uh, five points and all these subpoints that we uh, uh, oftentimes wrestle with. And, uh, so, and I'm not suggesting that those who, who preach like that uh, now are, are wrong or there's anything wrong with that, uh, but... Uh, uh, as I've gotten older, I've recognized that uh, uh, there's some real important things that God wants us to do, and he wants us to be a certain way and to reflect him and uh, his love to the world around us, and uh, sometimes we, we make that awfully complicated. Uh, I'd like to just begin uh, by reading uh, some verses here from the fourth chapter. Uh, by the way, if you... Uh, like to, to know, uh, I have taken the title uh, from actually a, a line uh, from a song that is uh, uh, by one of our contemporary Christian artists, uh, uh, Taryn Wells, and um, uh, I've just entitled this, this thought, this sharing today, uh, Fully Known and Fully Loved, and we'll see a little bit more about that in just a moment. Let's begin just in verse uh, number one here, and I'm going to kind of read along and and maybe just have some running commentary as we work our way through here. Uh, This section goes down through uh, verse 42, and uh, we we may not read uh, uh, every verse, but uh, uh, let's see what the Word of God has to say to us this morning. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, it's interesting. We see this, uh, this struggle back and forth, almost a cat and mouse kind of game between uh, Jesus and the religious leaders uh, who are trying to uh, trap him in something that they can use to bring some kind of charges against him, or at least to uh, slow down the growth of this uh, movement called the way. Um, And uh, it's interesting that even in the context of that, uh, there's some of that comparison, you know, is John baptizing more? You know, John the Baptist, he was so popular and people were flocking to him out in the wilderness. Uh, Or is Jesus baptizing more? The word came uh, somehow that Jesus was and reality was that his disciples were the ones that were baptizing anyone who 
uh, was coming to Jesus at that point. But uh, nevertheless, because of that, uh, Jesus uh, withdrew from, uh, from that area uh, down in the area where Jerusalem is located in, in the southern uh, part of, uh, of Israel and uh, made his way back up toward uh, Galilee and, and Judea and the area there where he had basically come from. And uh, it's interesting, the very next verse says this, now he had to go through Samaria. Now we could just kind of read over that and not be impacted by it, but uh, the reality was that the Jewish people had a deep-seated um, hatred, a uh, very strong dislike of the Samaritan people, uh, because way back in their history when uh, the Babylonians had come in and, and conquered them uh, there in the northern uh, kingdom, uh, tore down the uh, uh, the temple that had been built uh, there uh, in the Shechem area. Um, all of the, the quality people, according to them, uh, all of the uh, intellectual, the, the, the handsome, the, the good-looking, the, the people who they thought would be uh, a good addition to their, uh, uh, their society, they took all of those people with them into captivity, and they left behind uh, a whole group of uh, uh, ragtag uh, people who uh, uh, many in society probably wouldn't think a whole lot of, and over the years, as other foreigners began to come back into the land, uh, those Jewish people who had been left behind began intermarrying with those people, and so uh, long story short, it came to a point where they had developed a completely different uh, culture, uh, a completely different place to worship. Uh, they uh, built a temple on Mount Gerizim uh, there near uh, Shechem or Sychar, as it's noted uh, here in our text. And um, uh, there was this ongoing tension between the pure Jews and these half-breeds that uh, were occupying the, the northern part of, uh, of the kingdom of Israel. And uh, it, it even got so bad at one point in about uh, 128 or thereabouts B.C., um, the Jews went up into the northern kingdom uh, to Mount Gerizim and burned down their temple, uh, just eliminated it. Now, that's... Uh, that's one way of getting rid of the competition, I suppose. Uh, I, I certainly would not advocate that. We don't need to go out and uh, start burning churches. Uh, but uh, that just shows the level, the intensity of the animosity between those two groups. And the scripture here tells us that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now, uh, that doesn't mean somebody made him. Uh, this is indicative of a decision that he made. Um, I must go through Samaria. Now, going through Samaria was the shortest route, uh, if you will, between where they were coming from, up from the Jerusalem area, uh, back up to uh, Galilee. But right smack in the middle of that was the country of Samaria. And so many Orthodox Jews, those who uh, held to uh, the, the law very stringently and and uh, tried to maintain a purity of their religious uh, beliefs, uh, would not go through Samaria because they felt even getting the dust on the bottom of their feet would uh, defile them in some way. And uh, so they would take a, a long way uh, around. They would go across the Jordan River once, go up through uh, uh, the area there to the east of the Jordan River in when they got up to around where they needed to be, they would cross the Jordan River back over and enter into the area of Galilee, much further out, um, just to avoid going through that area. And so Jesus, to make a point in where he is in his ministry and what he's trying to show these followers of his and, and what he's trying to demonstrate to the world, he intentionally makes a point of going through Samaria. 
And it said he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, uh, used to be called Shechem uh, previously, uh, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, uh, in the Jewish economy, the way they counted uh, time was 6 a.m. was hour number one of the day. They be began then. And so the sixth hour uh, here would have been about noon. Uh, you may recall in the crucifixion uh, account, uh, it, I think it was uh, about the ninth hour that all this weird stuff started happening, the, uh, the thunder and, and darkness and, and so forth. That would have been 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So he, here at noon, at the height of the day, probably the hottest uh, time, sun straight up overhead, this lady uh, uh, comes there, as we see uh, here in just a moment, verse 7. Uh, Jesus had positioned himself there at the well, and the Bible says, verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town uh, to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then it reemphasizes this division, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And so she was just astounded that, uh, that Jesus would even speak to her and, on top of that, ask her for something. Um, this woman was a, an outcast of outcasts uh, in, in many ways. Uh, she was female, which in that male-dominated society was uh, uh, something that you had to avoid in terms of... Uh, uh, of contact in public. Uh, you didn't talk to other female uh, people that you didn't know or weren't part of your family. Uh, uh, lots of things. Uh, some uh, very, uh, very uh, strict uh, religious leaders, some of the Pharisees and so forth, uh, when they would encounter a woman in uh, public out in the market or whatever, they would, they would close their eyes or shade their eyes so that they wouldn't see this woman, wouldn't look at her, and uh, oftentimes, because of that, they would run into things. And so they were uh, referred to as the bruised ones. Uh, they were always banging the, their heads into uh, a wall or a post or, or some kind of thing. And so uh, there's a real deep-seated sort of thing, a legalism here that uh, is hard for us in one sense to understand. But if we are real honest with ourselves and dig a little deeper we recognize that we have some of those same kinds of legalistic ideas. Um, we, we might not close our eyes and, and not uh, attempt to look at a woman, but uh, um, they were very serious about uh, their religious expression. And so uh, here she's just astounded that Jesus would even speak to her. And he answered her in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God who, uh, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and hers? Now she's... She's hearkening back to her Jewish heritage, uh, which is, uh, is something that is true, and uh, all of this is historical. You can go back in the Old Testament and, and read about all of those events, but this place where they were located at Jacob's well was a very sacred place to the Jewish people. And... Um, so at any rate, she's bringing in uh, this historical stuff, this uh, uh, connection that she has with uh, uh, the line of, of uh, Jewish ancestry. And uh, Jesus says to her in verse 13, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. 
The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. You know, it's interesting how people just miss the point altogether. Uh, and many times people, when you share with them the gospel and what God wants to do in their lives, sometimes their initial thinking is, boy, I'd like that because that'd make my life better, easier. And the truth is um, that may not be the fact. That may not be the truth. In fact, for many of the followers of Jesus, including uh, John the Baptist, who uh, was jailed uh, during this period of time for speaking out against uh, the sins of, uh, uh, of one of the rulers there, uh, ended up having his head lopped off. Um, and, and so following Jesus uh, may or may not be an easier lifestyle, but it certainly brings... Uh, more to us that fills us and completes us than uh, any of the other things that we would try to hang on to uh, in the world. And so here, Jesus is trying to get her to the point of, of understanding this, uh, uh, and she takes it as being kind of a literal thing that would help her not have to come out here in the middle of the day. By, by the way, she was coming in the middle of the day to avoid all of the other women who would be coming in the early morning. You know, women, when they do stuff, they kind of gro- go in groups, herds. You know, have, you, have you noticed that? Uh, you know, the, the, the line in the, at the women's restroom is always uh, much longer than uh, uh, the line at the men's restroom. Uh, they go in groups. I'm not sure wh- what they do or what's going on there, uh, but... Uh, the same would have been true in that day and age. Uh, the women who were going out to draw water would go out early in the morning when it was cooler, and they would share with one another, talk with one another, you know, uh, share some gossip or stories or things, uh, helpful tips. And um, it was a time of fellowship, of gathering, and she was not able to go and be part of that because she was a woman of ill repute. Her background, her history, her lifestyle did not meet up with, did not match up with the legalistic sort of perspective that even the Samaritans had. And so uh, uh, Jesus goes on to to try to challenge her at this point and, and arrest her in the process of her journey. He told her, go back and call your husband and then come to see me. And she says in verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. She was living with someone. What we call sometimes in our society cohabitational living. That's uh, a fancy way of of, uh, talking about what uh, may may in fact uh, be uh, of concern to God and and of concern to him as far as your welfare is concerned. And and here Jesus says, you know, uh, what you've said is quite true. And then it's interesting, very interesting, if you've done uh, any uh, witnessing or trying to talk with people about uh, Jesus or about the faith, uh, when you begin to get real close to where they are and you you touch that raw nerve uh, so to speak uh, suddenly they w- oftentimes will recoil and try to change the direction of the of the conversation here she uses what even in our day and age oftentimes is used she suddenly uh, gets into a, uh, a dialogue or attempts to get into a dialogue about religion and, and who's right and who's wrong you know uh, now, this happened to be ab- about uh, places of worship, and uh, um, she, she starts by, you know, giving him what maybe appears to be a compliment. I, I kind of read it myself as, as maybe uh, kind of a sarcastic uh, remark. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Um, way back when uh, I was in uh, one of my early churches pastoring uh, uh, I had decided to buy a, 
a little red car. A red car is not probably the best thing to have for a uh, uh, for a minister. Uh, it was an Isuzu Impulse, so it wasn't you know wasn't a fancy car, but uh, it was a little sporty thing. And uh, it was right about the time that the Jim Baker stuff was going on in the er, in the late '80s, I guess it was. And uh, I happened to have my clergy ID badge for the hospital. I had it clipped to my uh, mirror. And uh, Linda and I went out to, to dinner one night and pulled up next to this big uh, four by four uh, uh, truck. And uh, as we were getting out, uh, apparently the, the man uh, driving or uh, sitting there in the driver's seat uh, saw the clergy uh, tag uh, hanging there. And he looked up and down at my car and he said, Yep, must be one of those televangelists. <laughs> and I thought, okay, <laughs> fine. But, you know, somebody can, can make a comment and say, you know, I perceive that you're a prophet or you, you must be a preacher. Um, and for them, that may or may not be uh, positive or negative, but it's kind of a deflection sort of thing as a... Uh, an attempt to uh, uh, turn things in a different direction. And uh, she then begins to raise this question about uh, the place of worship. She says in verse 20, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And then Jesus says something very, very powerful here. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when the will uh, or when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and and truth for they are the kind of worshipers the father seeks god is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth what jesus says there holds some very powerful instruction for us today uh, a lot of folks think that um, just because they are connected with a, a church or they're a member of uh, a religious group or what, whatever the case may be, that somehow that makes them all right, okay, spiritually. Um, and, uh, and then they get into uh, debates about what is the proper way to worship and where is the proper place and uh, I can remember uh, over the years, and I guess to some degree there's some, still some of this, uh, uh, we used to talk about the, the worship wars uh, that uh, were going on in the church. And, you know, uh, do you do hymns? You know, do you do contemporary music? Do you, do you have instruments like we have up here? Or do you just have a, you know, a pipe organ uh, and a piano? Uh, uh, there are all kinds of things that... <laughs> we as religious people get worked up about and, uh, and have some very, uh, very heated discussions about those things. And uh, they have absolutely nothing to do with who Jesus is. Have absolutely nothing to do with how we worship. Uh, whether we're in a building that looks like a Dollar General store uh, or if you're in a, a gorgeous cathedral, with all the accruements of, uh, of uh, historical uh, religious activity, um, none of that matters. In fact, the place where we worship is absolutely meaningless. Jesus says it's the attitude that we have when we worship. And he says we must come and worship in spirit and in truth. That word spirit, a pneuma, is just kind of a general uh, Greek word that uh, uh, speaks of 
the Spirit of God. We see in the book of Genesis, God breathing into man the Spirit of life. Uh, we see uh, throughout uh, a variety of settings there how uh, wind or breath uh, is a way of, uh, of describing the, the Holy Spirit. And so there's that connection. He says God is spirit, very same word he uses earlier. And he says if we're going to worship, we have to come in that frame of reference. Yes, we bring our flesh with us, uh, but then we have to put it on the altar and uh, uh, die to self. But we have to worship in spirit and then in, in truth. That, now, that truth there doesn't necessarily mean... Uh, uh, that you have all your doctrinal points uh, and all your doctrinal ducks in a row. Uh, the truth there is just simply speaking about the reality, the transparency, the, the realness, that's not a good word, but uh, of how we worship. That we come to Jesus, as I prayed earlier, with open hands and open hearts, recognizing that he already knows who we are and what's going on in our lives. And so, much like this woman, Jesus, in just sharing with her very gently, kind of peeled back the, the layers of the onion until he got down to the place where the hurt, the pain, the, the, the tragedy of her life really was. And then he takes her at that point and says, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And I, I, I just feel very, um, very confident that uh, in order for, for God to move in this place and for God to do what he wants to do among us, we've got to get to this place where indeed we are are fully known and fully loved. We recognize that God knows us down to the very core of our being. Um, I brought with me a couple of things that uh, I was just going to use to close by way of, of an illustration. And if nothing else, if you don't remember anything else uh, about the message today, uh, I hope you'll pay close attention to... Uh, to what I'm about to uh, to share here. Now, those those of you uh, older folks who may be from Kentucky, this is not what you what you what you might think it think it is. Okay, just to clarify that. <coughs> I'm going to put this here just in case. I picked out the most sanctified looking uh, towel that I could find. Doesn't that, doesn't that look holy? Some people worry about that kind of thing. What, what I'm going to share here is simply a, 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 an illustration of how God wants to work in our lives and, and how Jesus was working in the life of this woman. Um, this little mason jar would represent a person's life. It, it can represent, if you will, the, the Samaritan woman. Uh, you can think of it in terms of your own life. But he, he, here it is. The water of your life. Uh, and then as we put some stuff that we get engaged in into the water, it suddenly gets to the place where 
doesn't look very appealing, does it? Now, for many in religious circles, they would tell us that before we come to God, we've got to get all of that dirt, all that junk out of our lives. And that's exactly the opposite of what Jesus taught and what he demonstrated in his earthly ministry. So how, how do you get all of that junk out of your life? How does God work to do that? God uses clean water. And you could say that this is that spring of living water, if you will, that Jesus spoke of. And if you allow the spring to flow into you, and to just continue to fill you up to overflowing. You see what happens. I dare not make a mess here. Yes, that's right. Now, now the water looks pretty much like it was. Pristine clean, pure. There's a little bit of sediment down in the bottom there. Uh, but if you pour enough water into there, you allow the, the spring of living water to flow into you enough. You don't have to try to get rid of all of the things in your life. Jesus does that as you allow him to love you just as you are. I want to read just a quick quote and I'll close with this. Uh, this is from Timothy Keller uh, in a book entitled The Meaning of Marriage. And um, it was from this quote that uh, Torrin Wells uh, wrote uh, his uh, song entitled Known. And uh, you may want to look that up uh, on uh, the Internet or Spotify or something and, and uh, listen to the words of that. But here, here's the quote that Timothy Keller made. To be loved but not known is comforting, but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear, rejection. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty that life can throw at us. Oh, to be fully known and fully loved. The good news, the gospel, is that you are. That Jesus is right there waiting to allow you to experience that in your life personally. And so as we close this morning, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Brian, but I would just invite you, uh, we always have our, our altars open here at the front, if you feel that you need to come and pray, uh, maybe there's some junk in your life that uh, you thought of as I was pouring the water in and the dirt was coming out. Uh, maybe some things that you need to wrestle with uh, Jesus about and allow him to, to wash you, to cleanse you. Uh, there may be some things relating to how we view other people and the judgment that we have in our hearts as we look at people. And maybe we need to look to Jesus to see what his attitude was and um, let him love you today just as you are just where you are and allow him to make those changes in your life as he did in the woman at the well let's bow for a brief prayer our heavenly father just take your word and use it lord i just pray that you would uh, uh, allow the seed that needs to be planted in each individual heart, 
Lord, to be planted there, to germinate, to be cultivated, and then to grow into something that would be of benefit, not just to that individual, but, Lord, that they could impact their entire family, their entire community, and, Lord, be like this Samaritan woman who went and told all of the people in town, come and see, come and see this man, Jesus. And, Lord, we need to be about the business of doing that. Thank you for your love. Thank you for loving us just like we are. But thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us like that, that you're still at work in our lives even today. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.